Today we're here with Jeremy Haas. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the seven secrets to surviving an attack. And this can apply for just about anybody. Um, I met Jeremy three or four months ago, uh, took some classes from him, and, and was just thoroughly impressed. So what I'd like to do is talk to him today and let's get his idea for all of us out there. If, if something were to happen, the, the unimaginable, the unthinkable thing happened, how we could survive that and get away and go back to our families. So welcome, Jeremy. It's good to see you. Thanks, sir. Uh, really kind of want to start off with an intro of you and let you kind of tell our folks exactly what your background is and kind of why you're an expert in this field. Gotcha. I don't, <laughs> I don't know about expert, but I've spent a lot of time doing it. Uh, it started off kind of like kids. I mean, I remember going as a, as a young kid seeing the karate kid and bugging my parents. I want to take karate class. I want to take karate class because for whatever reason, I could identify with the, the kid in that film. That was me, kind of out of place, just didn't really fit. So that was my thing. Never was overly athletic. So as I went through this, I learned a little bit about athleticism, about some coordination, and I kind of found my little niche in the world doing karate as a kid. Uh, did that from 1984, I guess, is when I started. I was eight years old and just continued on all the way through high school. Uh, some college, joined the military, and so no matter where I was at, I was always training. I always find some little corner to, to go teach in, some little corner to go get with somebody and train. So it's been something that I've done. Um, I've done it so long now, I don't know how not to do it. <laughs> it's just a part of me. Uh, but it was, you know, Okinawa Karate, and then I liked that, so it was Judo and Jiu Jitsu and all of these different things, and it's kind of odd how it all took shape, but now looking back at it, now that I'm well in my 30s and creeping up on 40, it was, uh, I don't necessarily believe in destiny, but everything's fallen in place so that I can kind of get to the point that I'm at now. Uh, idea being that 27 and a half years of martial arts training, multiple black belts, I mean, fifth and sixth degree black belts, a couple of different styles, and uh, I look at it all, and some parts are great for, for some things, some parts are great for others, but there wasn't anything that just kind of fit the, the, the mold of the average person. You spend 10, 15 years training in a martial art to become pretty proficient at it, and some of those guys are certified like tough guys, but 10 or 15 years isn't a sufficient amount of time for mom who wants to learn self-defense. How, how do I protect myself from whatever attack I might be threatened with, a purse snatching, somebody grab a hold of you to pull you into a car, so my lead up through all of that, all the martial arts training, 10 years of military being deployed around the world and getting to train with people from Scotland, from Ireland, from Cyprus, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, all of these different places and their different spins on how they learn martial arts all feed into to kind of what I've got now. Um, it was, you know, a lot, of, a lot of getting hit in the face, <laughs> my nose made out of rubber and plastic because I continually just get knocked around, but it was all an effort to find out what's going to work. What can I do? What can I rely on? Almost every single time, just gonna save my bacon and get me out of a would-be confrontation. Uh, got out of the military in 2006 and have been involved in law enforcement since that time. So I've dealt with folks on the street, people in the corrections environment, jails, prison type sets of setups. Uh, just various different situations. So some, some of what I got to try against the people that have, have done a lot of fighting, a lot of little sneak attacks and cheap shots to get a wallet or a purse or to get over on somebody. It's not the, the gentleman's sport of we're going to back up, we're going to put our fist up, we're going to be fair and not hit below the belt. It's the ugly, nasty, gritty, biting and kicking and stick your finger in your eye or whatever you've got to do to, to get out. Uh, Traditional martial arts are great. I still practice them, I still teach them. I, I have a passion for them, I love them. However, some of what you learn in a traditional martial art is very esoteric. It's based on technique, it's based on theory, and you need that theory to be able to stay calm in that. However, if I can take the very, very basic techniques, take 30 years and cut it down to a dozen, 15 different techniques, say these are the ones that work, and then focus it on what's my body going to do anyhow. If somebody jumps out from behind a closet door, poof, what are we going to do? Oh, you know, the shoulders are going to hunch up, the hands come up, we have this ingrained response, this reflex, if you will, to, uh, to go into this panicked almost state for just a split second to protect ourselves. 
It's just what we've done or what we've developed over millions of years of evolution, if you will. It's, and that's kind of what kind of what we're kind of leaning toward as we go into all. This. Exactly. That's that's the direction. Uh, I encourage people go practice a martial art. Pick one one that suits you. If it's judo, if it's jujitsu, it's karate. You'll learn a lot about yourself. It'll help you get in shape, which obviously is good for a million. <laughs> it's good for a million reasons. It'll help you in the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, as far as heart to be heart disease, diabetes, all of these things. But if I'm doing all that, why not use that to my benefit along with these principles that we try to teach in our self-defense to really amplify things? I can take somebody that's had no martial arts training, no physical real activity, not an athlete, just an average person off the street, an average mom out of her house, spend an hour with her doing some of these things and develop a very effective almost reflexive on her part set of basic techniques that will get her out of, I can't say all because there's nothing in life is guaranteed, but virtually every situation that she could find herself in, an easy enough way to at least escape and get back home, do what she has to do, get the authorities and, and survive that, that, that attack. Right, and that's what we're talking about is how are we gonna survive this? What are, the, what are the things we need to do? What's kind of like the first thing you know, if we're going to take this down in order, you know, we have seven principles that we really want to talk about. Right. We're going to kind of start, where is the first part? Of it? Where does it really begin? I mean, is it mindset, awareness? I mean, it's, what type is it? It is absolutely 100% mindset. Uh, I use the word self-defense in seminars and class to lead up to a bigger idea. The bigger one is more self-survival or self-preservation. It's not self-defense. When you say self-defense, you immediately go into a back and up defensive idea. I have to protect myself against this attack. Right. If I adjust this and adjust my mindset, my view on things into, I'm not trying to defend against anything. I have to survive. You will be more apt to use basic techniques and apply these basic techniques to get yourself out of it because we're no longer defending. If somebody's going to attack me, I've got two options. I have space, I run, I get out of it, life's good but my back's against the wall. I've got my kids. I don't always have the option of running. I can't leave my kids there to, to deal with this guy or whatever the case might be. When running for me singly is an option, sometimes it's not. So in that situation, you can't be thinking, I have to defend against this when there's somebody else dependent upon you or you need to get home to somebody. The idea is that you need to go ahead, draw the line in the sand, stand your ground, have played these scenarios through your head a million different ways prior to this ever happening so when the when the confrontation the encounter takes place it's not you on your heels and scared trying to figure out what am i going to do i've been through this a million times before i'm prepared i've done the basic moves i understand these basic moves that we're going to practice the basic concepts behind them and now you've got this confidence to deal with this attacker so mindset will buy you leeway a, an attacker or would be attacker starts to deal with you and realizes just through the initial interaction from the very, very beginning, oftentimes they're gonna move on, pick a better victim, a weaker victim, somebody else, because they can see that immediately you're not intimidated. You're going to stand your ground. You're going to stand up for yourself because you have something to, to get home to safely. And it's kind of like the bullet. Once he gets knocked in the nose, he goes someplace else. Well, sure, yeah. There's I mean, other people out there he, that he can pick up. Exactly. The bigger school bully pushes one kid, he gets pushed back, he'll move along nine times out of 10 or more even. So that, that's what we want to work initially is that mindset. Sure. I, military calls it combat mindset. Right. Uh, same type of thing in the police department and all the law enforcement. They're always about this combat mindset, this, this playing of these things ahead of time. It's just a total preparedness, not a matter of thinking. When it happens, I need defense. Right. And, so it, and it's almost along with that, that mindset of this is going to happen. But we also have to be willing to take steps that we otherwise wouldn't normally think of or things that we, we might have to do something to a person that we that's just not natural for us. That's that's, you know, that's, that's that's very true. And some people the best way to put it is some of the stuff that we practice, some of the stuff that we teach makes some people a little squeamish. But on the flip side of that, if I hit somebody and he's bleeding out of his nose or a tooth comes out, heaven forbid, uh, you hit him back in the arm and you hear crunch when an elbow breaks, it's unpleasant. People go, ooh, I don't want to do that. That's that, that sounds like it would hurt. It does hurt. That's the idea. We, we want to 
inflict as much pain, as much discomfort, as much hurt, overwhelm this person as fast as we can so that I can get the hell out of this situation. I need to survive this situation. If I hit you in the side of the neck and while things are all dizzy, all of a sudden whap, smack you in the face with a palm heel and your nose is crushed, you got blood running, tears coming down your eyes, you're already dizzy from being struck in the side of the neck. You, as the attacker, now are no longer on the attack. You're starting to think, oh, my face, my nose, my eyes, I've got room. This is the time that I can push off and get the heck out of there. Absolutely. And absolutely. So that's, but some people are leery about that. We say that and they get a little squeamish. I have to remind them, you're a little squeamish about doing this to this guy, but what's he going to do to you? He's Is he holding a knife on you? Yeah. Is he going to, to take your purse and now be scared and stick a knife into you because you can identify him? Uh, is he going to do something to you in front of your children? Is he going to drag you in an alleyway or into a car and rape you? All of which extremely unpleasant situations, things we don't like to talk about, things we don't like to address. But if I stick my head in the sand, eventually somebody's going to come along and kick me in the ass because I couldn't see what was coming. Right. I may as well be looking around and prepared. And that's, and that's an excellent point. So it kind of brings us up to one of the other things that we've spoken about is the situational awareness. A lot of times, at least as it seems like in the news and things that we see, people find themselves in positions they probably shouldn't have been in. I mean, how do you address that? I mean, what is it that you do to see that that doesn't happen? The, the lead up to any good self-preservation, self-survival is that what we just talked about a second ago, my mindset. My mindset's right, part of my mindset goes into the next little step, this next little, these six, seven, eight steps that we use to survive these things. And it is that, that awareness situation. My head's on a swivel, I'm looking, I'm paying attention when I'm out on the street. I don't want to get run over by a car. What do we tell our kids to do? Look both ways before you cross the street. Why? There's danger when you get into the street. If I'm walking down the sidewalk, there is always the possibility of danger. Be it a car comes down off the street and this guy is in a, a diabetic fit and runs his car up on the sidewalk. If I'm not looking, I get hit by a car. If I'm not paying attention to the doorways as I'm walking down the sidewalk to where somebody might come out that doorway, I get run over by the UPS man pushing a car. Or I get a crackhead that jumps on me saying, give me your purse because he's looking for his next $5 rock. When, had I been paying attention to those openings, those spots, those little funnels, if you will, you start to see those things and you can take a step or two to the side. You're not there. He knows he can't surprise you. It, it, you negated the whole confrontation before it ever so even took place. Didn't need to get anything else. Exactly. And walk it's, across the street and I'm out. I'm out of exactly. And it, it's just simple enough from... I nag my wife about using the phone, coming out of Walmart. She's walking through the park lot, talking on the phone, hey, I'm about to come home, and clicking the clicker on the car and digging through her purse or looking for keys. And she is so in that little world at that point in time that you can walk up to the car and be standing behind the car. And she clicks the button, hop right in the car with her, grab her purse, do whatever you wanted to do at that point in time. Now, she doesn't do this anymore, obviously, because I'm... I, I bribe her <laughs> relentlessly about do this, do that, and she's taken upon that same mindset. She'll remind me oftentimes right. of the mistakes that I make. I'll be coming out somewhere and digging for a key in my pocket or looking at this or looking at that and not paying attention to, to mine. So as we, as we do this, of course, now it's a game in our house. Uh, you could have been got here. You could have been got there. So, of course, but it's, it's that awareness. It's that having, you have to know what's going on. We're not going to open our car door and stand between the frame of the car and the door of the car set our purse in the seat and dig through our purse looking for a cell phone. You're trapped in the funnel, you can't go anywhere. The guy that approaches from that side, you're stuck. You can't go anywhere. A better plan, shut the car door, set your purse on the hood where you can see what's going on while you get what you need to do. So it's little bitty, little changes in habits that make you aware of your surroundings. Oftentimes, this attacker, keep, keep this attacker is going to avoid it. He looks at this and says, you know what, this isn't an optimal situation to grab this purse, to grab this car. and. You know, it's been, I've done studies, I was to Angola when I was working on my master's for criminology, all these different things, I was looking at different degrees, and talked to serial rapists, serial murderers, kidnappers, and you start to find these common threads. And these threads all come back to awareness. They're watching these people and how they pick their victims, and it was always somebody that was distracted off of their own little world and had no idea about what was going on in this world around them. They get somebody that was looking, that was paying attention, they already had their keys out and were ready when they got to the car to get in, unlock it, get in the car and shut the door and be done. They're, it's not worth their time, it's not worth their effort and the, the, how much <laughs> how much of a, a scene it's going to cause to fight somebody 
that is prepared, that does know what's going on, as opposed to somebody that doesn't, that you shove them in a car and you go. So that's probably the biggest part is mindset awareness. If you can negate 90% of what happens, you're, you're well into good. I bet the man will take that any day of the week right. that you'll survive that before it ever takes place. It kind of it, it kind of leads us into personal space because I know that there's a, there's a term out there. Yeah, there there is uh, in the Japanese arts, they have different different names as far as high, low, mid levels, all these different names. And so in my classes, I still refer to them by Japanese name from time to time. But we're in America, so we teach it in English. But every now and then, there's a little catch. Something just fits. And this one is what they call the Mai. The Mai is your combat space. It's that space that if I'm talking to somebody in front of me and I take a, a snapshot of them and I crop the picture down to their shoulders, to their feet, and then I lay their body over in front of me, that distance, the height from their shoulders to their feet between me and them is the Mai. That's my space. That's me putting my arm out. This is my space. They get closer than that, now you're in my space. But the Japanese term is the my, and it's not spelled in Y, but it's pronounced my, my space. So if you're in my space, and I don't know you, you're not a family member, you're not a good friend, we always have, everybody has this tendency to get uncomfortable. We've established space limits in America that are different than space limits, say, in the Middle East, for example. They're, they're comfortable being a lot more close to each other. We've got it, and it works out well for us that we've already established this, that I have a certain amount of room that buys me kind of a buffer, if you will, between me and somebody that I don't know that well. And I don't, if I don't know them that well, obviously I don't always know their intentions. So the my buys me a little bit of room to function when things Absolutely. go south. And, and it plays into the whole situational awareness. You exactly. See, when I start encroaching on that area, okay, I need to pay a little more attention. Sure. I start to make steps. I start to, to blade my body, do those little things that buy me that little bit more room so that I can maintain the my, my, my distance. And, and so and we always find ourselves at times, we're, we're going to be in a group of people, we're not isolated, so people are going to get in that space. Sure. And we're, going to, we're going to have people in there. And so what are some of the things that we can look at, maybe cues that, that something unpleasant is about to happen? Gotcha. I'm sure there are things out there that if you just look enough, you go, you know, this just really feels uncomfortable to me. That's a, a big part, again, of this total awareness survival is listening to your gut, your instincts. In, in the law enforcement world, when you don't listen to your instincts, bad things happen. <laughs> if you're walking down the street, you're in the mall, in a restaurant, wherever you're at, and you get that little feeling way deep down the pit of your gut, and you hear that little voice up here say, something doesn't feel right, listen to that. There's a reason that that plays in. That's Again, it goes right back almost to a primal, instinctual, reflex type deal that you know when something isn't right. You know when somebody's looking at you. You know when somebody's watching you. you just, Sitting there and all of a sudden you get this feeling, somebody's watching me, you look and, oh, there's this guy over here in a booth at a restaurant. I don't have any idea that's been giving me the, the evil eye for however long, but for some reason we have a tendency to be able to pick up on those, those things, this feeling that just happens. If, if we pay attention. If, if we pay attention. Now, oftentimes people will, you know, I was walking down the street or I was in this location and I got that feeling and I didn't listen to it. And then, inevitably, you'll start to hear the story behind it of how somebody was mugged or got sucker punched or jumped on from behind. Whereas if they had just listened to that little gut feeling, that little instinct, that little voice in your head telling you something's not right, why don't you take a look around or maybe it's time to leave. Right. Uh, my younger days, I ran around in some places <laughs> that weren't, weren't always the, the, most, uh, <laughs> the most appealing places to be in, places I wouldn't take my wife and kids to now. And any time I saw something happen, a bar fight, a street fight, whatever it was, you knew ahead of time, sometimes minutes ahead of time, not just seconds, minutes ahead of time, this is about to go south. Right. And if one person involved in that thing had just said, set their drink down, you know what, it's time for me to go, and left, some of it never would have happened. Right. Again, so now we go back to that, that listen to your gut, those cues. Uh, as you're in those spaces with people, somebody's in, in your little space, in your distance, they walk up to you on the street, hey, can I have a dollar? I, don't, I need bus fare, or can I have a couple bucks for dinner, whatever it is. Oftentimes, they don't mean any harm by it, they're just bumming money. I mean, it's just, it's just what, they're, it's what they do if they've been getting money like that, so they'll ask everybody. Uh, occasionally, one of them will walk up and you get this feeling, wait, you your stomach, something, this isn't just the average guy asking for a dollar. Something's not right. I'm twitching a little bit. And that's that's those cues. I look for that. Where are his eyes going? He's looking around. He's not. He's talking to me, but he's not looking at me. He's not right. 
talking to me. He's looking over here while we're talking and looking over here while we're talking. You know, I, and now I start to wonder, what's he, what's he looking at? Is he looking for his buddy that's going to jump on me from behind? Right. Is he looking to see if there's anybody else looking before he pops me in the jaw and grabs my wallet when I get my wallet out to give him a dollar? Uh, so you get those little things like that, that shift in that weight side to side, this uneasiness and the, the kind of, a, sometimes you'll get a stutter, I'm not stuttering your voice, but you get this nervous little speech hitch. pattern, little hitches, and it's like they're, they're struggling. Right. I'm going to say there's all of these little cues that you start to pick up on. Uh, I've done some training with some of the Israeli Defense Force guys and IDF, and they've got a whole series, a whole system of monitoring a person's behavior so that you can pick out a terroristic type threat, who might pose a threat, who might be a criminal, who's planning something. And so a lot of it I kind of gleaned from them was this, a guy that's nervous. He's not, you know, why would you be nervous? You're coming asking me for a dollar. You'd want to be as friendly as you possibly could. Absolutely. Why are you nervous about this? So I have to, you wonder about those things. And how you present yourself to them may make the decision for them. Are they going to continue on with a possible violent attack? Or are they just going to take the dollar and leave? Or will they just accept, no, I don't have a dollar. All I got is credit card, sorry, and go on their way. Right. So it comes back to that, this, this uh, aura, if you will, or whatever you want to talk about, <laughs> this, this image that you put off, whatever it is that you pass out to them that takes place in this little bone of chess right. that happens in the verbiage and the body cues ahead of time. Uh, you know, if you're pretty meek and mild, obviously, predator prey, they're looking, this might be easier prey to pick off than the person that's aware, that knows what's happening, that's willing to face to face deal with them right on the spot and either tell them, nope, you're not getting a dollar, you need to go ask somebody else, move along, whatever it is, or if you accept to give them a dollar. There's a million things we could get into, ways to negate this, carry a little money in your front pocket so you don't have to give up your wallet or your ID. There's all these other little things. That's, that's later on. That's something I'll share later on as we get into this deeper. But there's all of these little tips and tricks. But essentially, you know when somebody's in that space, right. and then you have to figure their intentions. You start to look, are they clenching their jaw? Are they dropping their chin? Is a sucker punch coming? Are they, are they making their fist? Are they clenching their fist? Or are they starting to reach behind them for maybe a knife that they've got in their back pocket, a gun they got in their back pocket? Or are they just hiding their clenched fist? Are they hiding this behind them? So as you start to reach for your wallet, boom, they smack you in the nose and try to grab this wallet and run. Uh, so there's all of these little things. Again, this and this usually will tell you if you if you open your ears, open your eyes, and listen to that stuff. It'll more often than not tell you what's going to happen and buy you room to deal with what you got to. So we did everything right, or, or maybe we did something wrong. However it ended up, now we have this person that's going to attack us. We've kind of, you know, we've, we've tried to do what we can, but yeah, sometimes just bad things happen. There, there are evil people in this world. Doesn't matter what you do. Some people are just hell bent on. They're going to attack this person. Get this thing. They're desperate for dope money. They're desperate for money to pay their rent. Whatever it is, some people in this world have already decided I'm going to get this thing. It doesn't matter how prepared I am. Right. This confrontation happens. It's coming. And, and so, and as. As a lay person, someone not trained in martial arts, um, there are ways to protect ourselves. I'm assuming that are fairly, uh, I don't know, reflexes, if you will. Yeah, you know. reflexive, instinctual type things that we do. I mean, how do you train a combat troop in the military <clears throat> in two weeks' time to go out and be prepared for hand-to-hand -hand combat? Right. They use some of the same principles. Uh, you can't. They don't have time. They can't spend 10 years learning right. all of this stuff and then hope that when the time comes, I step back into my stance and I apply this block <laughs> and I, it's, just yeah, not it's not gonna happen. In, in the martial arts, you do that to prepare this for that time when there's a hurricane going on and you're trying to remain in the eye of the storm and you've done these moves long enough that they become instinct, they become muscle memory. And if they don't work, okay, I got hit but I continue to fight. That's the value of a martial arts class where it's controlled is you start to learn how to survive in the eye of that hurricane. You can do the exact same thing, the exact same type of training with these techniques. It works just as well. And so there's, you use what's been bred into us. You know, for a million years, these things happen. Some, somebody throws an object. I'm sitting in the baseball stand, for example, I'm just watching a ball game. Boom, cracks the bat, back breaks in half, half the bat comes flying up into the stands. Get a picture of it, get a video, go back and watch on slow motion. Everybody that bat's going to does something. 
their head ducks, they start to move their body away, their shoulders come up trying to protect the sides of their neck, their ears, so that you can keep the, the CPU running, if you will. The arms start to come up, the hands start to move towards that thing because they're thinking, put distance, put something between me and that danger, that whatever that, that stimulus is. So the body is going to do it. I've watched it millions of times over and over and over on countless videos, students that do it. Uh, I've seen masters in martial arts been doing 50 years. Uh, some of the Okinawa Japanese masters, they're always, you know, they should be, oh, they're going to do this. And then you run up to them, boom, and what they do, boom. It just happens. They can't not do it. It's what we do. So you use that reflex to our advantage. You can use it to your disadvantage. This happens, and now I've got a lot more area to cover before I can get back into my stance and try to apply that block, and by then, I've been hit. So we're going to use this natural response, this natural reflex, to feed into our techniques. It essentially is a bridge into the training, into that defensive tactic style training, that survival stuff that we're going to use. Kind of going back to the, the, the mind and my space. Mm -hmm. I, I'm putting this out here because I want to keep them out of my space. Yeah, this is my mind. So I can protect my area. This is where it all kind of starts. Exactly. So, so okay, so they've come in and the guy's gonna he's gonna take a swing, he's gonna do whatever he does, and we're gonna use these different motor skills and, and again reflective in nature, mm -hmm. big gross movements. We're not sure. gonna do we're not well, doing any fine techniques, are we? Talk to talk to any cop, anybody that's been in a real street fight, and ask them what they remember. What what happened? I, I know a cop one time was involved in a shooting in Oklahoma City and uh, say so he shot his gun once and he thought his gun jammed. He said pull the pull trigger, nothing was happening. At this point in time, he's telling me he doesn't remember hearing anything, doesn't remember the gunshot going off, he doesn't remember hearing his partner, doesn't remember anything that was said. It was a tunnel. So he had this elevated heart rate, boom, it kicks off, heart rate jumps up, adrenaline dumps, you start to lose fine motor skills. I'm not able to tie my shoes anymore. I couldn't button and unbutton my shirt anymore. I can swing my arms like a windmill, like I'm chopping at somebody, certainly. Uh, a cop that trains enough can get a hand on a gun and do this, certainly, big gross motor stuff. I can close my hands, close my fist, but fine things, absolutely not. So we've got the mindset, situational awareness, we want to make sure we don't walk around with our heads going to uh, like, Right, yeah, my head's not in the clouds. Yeah. I may see the clouds, but yeah. I'm seeing everything that's going on. Pay attention to what's going on. So, you know, i got some guys standing over in the corner, and you kind of keep an eye on him. Sure, absolutely. We see that. And, it, and most of the time, there's no harm. I mean, there's something. The guy's just there. Right. But we need to pay attention. But if he no. knows that you know that he's yeah, there, he we may also eliminate the situation. Right. Taking, taking a look at our space, making sure that you know we have our space, being aware that we have it, and there's an area that makes us uncomfortable. Exactly. Right? I keep keep people outside yeah. my comfort zone, my buffer, and it's not to be ugly. Even in law enforcement, all of a sudden, I'm going to shake my hand, and I have to tell them, sorry, I don't shake hands. Well, it seems rude. Well, that's my space, and I'm carrying a weapon. I don't want somebody in my space. So a lot of times I'll tell them, you know, I've got a cold, excuse me, I'm not going to shake your hand, I've just been fighting this hand, I won't make you sick. There's polite ways around it. But you can keep that space, obviously, in a situation you get that little voice telling you, yeah, this might be uncomfortable. So yeah. and there's it, ways. And along with that, looking for the, the, the signs, the telltale signs yeah. of the something's cues. about to happen. Yeah, the, those, those body cues, that, that nervousness, that sweating, the, the shifty thing the guy that won't really make eye contact with us look at he's wanting to see you who is there another victim or is there a witness or my buddies here so yeah you start to read those yeah. cues easy cues to read once you know what they are but then we did all that and the attack happened and so now we get back to the reflexes ah, right yeah the panic yeah. reflex that startle panic yeah. reflex response and, and it's genetically ingrained in our DNA to do it. Cavemen would do it. A dinosaur comes in to swoop on them. What do you think they're going to do? Oh, no! It's the same thing we're going to do when a big fist starts flying towards me. It's that panic, try to back up, run away, cover myself up, protect right. this. That's what gets me through. And it leads right into the gross motor skills. Exactly. Do that, it's everything. Because we're yeah. just big movements, big, actually strong yeah. movements, anything that a, an average female can deal with the average male with because she's positioned herself in a naturally strong position, kind of a pyramid shape, this wedge, if you would, you know, a small steel wedge will bust open the biggest piece of an oak tree. Right. So that's what we look for is how do we use this wedge principle into that attack so that I can bust him open and get through it and get on home. So we, we survived, we managed to get this guy off of us and now we make the determination whether or not yep. we have to protect family, the, yeah, the final or, assessment. Or can I just get my tail out of here? Exactly. Is that final assessment, is he still a threat? Is he not a threat? He's a threat. Continue to engage until he's neutralized. 
If he's no longer what you deem to be a threat to you, your family, anybody else, now it's time for you to disengage and get out of there before it becomes that now you're the aggressor. Everybody has a cell phone. Rest assured, somebody's watching. There's a security camera, somebody's watching. This guy's on his hands and knees, spitting out his teeth, and you run over and give him a big kick in the face for good measure, you're probably, you're, you're gonna, you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're now in the same situation he was in. Both of y'all are end up in trouble. You don't, there's no way to justify to continue to attack against, not necessarily a down, but a neutralized opponent, a neutralized attacker. So you have those decisions to make. When is it that I'm safe? And if I can, if I make the case, I still fear for my life, absolutely 100% within your rights to defend yourself until you no longer have that fear. Well, Jeremy, I appreciate your time. I appreciate it, Jim. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And, and I hope our, our viewers and folks out there enjoy it as well. It'd be great. Thank you. Thank you.